Steve, back at it. Good to see you, my friend. Hey, good to see you. Good to see you. So I'm a little bit chesty today because I've got a little bit of a bronchitis, but I'll do my best. Well, like I always say, you know, they, uh, it keeps it real. I, 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 was, I was reading an article the other day um, that if you ever notice, Brad Pitt is always eating in movies. And somebody interviewed him once and said, what, why do you do that? He says, because it makes me more relatable. I'm human. Right. So I'm like, wow, clever move. And it really does. It makes him seem like the everyman. So, Steve, for your, you know, surgical robotic and med tech superpowers, you're making yourself more relatable to the rest of us. Thank you. <laughs> so um, reporting from the front, I thought it would be fun to chat today about a couple things. I, I think the especially the, the large format um, sort of landscape is really heating up. I came back from Sages. We can talk about that. And then you always have some great insight about really how hard it is to get a soft tissue robot, not just to market, but there are other sort of chasms to cross at that point in time. So I'll, I'll open up that with you and then we'll cut into Sages. Yeah, it, it's something that I've, um, you know, I've, I've tried to help a lot of people understand over the time that, you know, making a, a single prototype and the engineers will hate me, is easy, right? Well, it's all relative, right? So it's it's fairly easy to make a prototype, and then you can make three prototypes, then you can make some pre-production models, some production models, and you can make your first series that come off the line, and, and they kind of work. The challenge is um, when you go out commercial, and now you've got to make hundreds of these things, and then as an organization, you have to deploy hundreds of them, and you have to service them, support them, educate on them. And... I don't, you know, it doesn't matter how good you are as a company, just look at the history. Everybody's robot comes out of the box with some issues, right? And it, it, may, it may not be on robot number two or number three, maybe on robot number 100, but I think you've got to get sort of like 5,000 to 10,000 cases in with maybe 50 to 100 robots out there before you really start seeing some of those warts come out. And, 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 and that's what then just makes it really, really hard because the bar that you're up against is the intuitive bar, which is this, you know, 98.5% uptime, et cetera. And, and they've done it and been through it and they have problems at the beginning, but that their stuff works. So your benchmark is hard and then just doing it is hard and commercializing it is hard and building more of them is hard and keeping the financing of that going is hard. So yeah, it's just really, really hard to do it. And, and you know, you bring up an interesting point. You get five out, you get 10 out, you get 50 out. So I think nearly every single surgical robotic organization I've been involved in building is coming out of a university lab back in the day. Like the genesis of a lot of these roboticists who had these really clever ideas, they never really started at the patient like most medical devices do and then work backwards. If they did, our large format robots would look a lot different today, starting from the end effector and how, what they do to tissue, but that's a whole nother discussion. So it usually comes out of a university setting with a couple really smart roboticists who get this clever idea, and then they take it a little further downstream and without intention start to set up an architecture of a system, both mechanical, software, firmware, electrical. And then it just compounds on those things. And then eventually you say, oh, we've got something that works. It works in the lab, maybe first in human. Now let's take it out. And then what happens is, to your point, as we get more mileage on it, and here's a point. So you've had Hugo out, I don't know, they first they did their first case uh, in the US back in December, 2022. I think uh, that, that trial was supposed to be 122 patients in six sites. I don't know where it sits today, you might know. But if you go in the UK in March, they had three urgent field safety notices on console, arm and tower that should have never happened, arguably, um, after you've had a robot in the field, even though it's in clinicals that long. And, and that, that ends up being a systemic issue, doesn't it? Yeah, so I, I think the problem is these systems are so complex from the, from the tip that touches the patient to the plug in the wall. You know, everything about the robot is hard. And I think there's two or three issues that, that, that can crop up there. One is some of these, you know, when you have a software upgrade, there's a latent bug that you just, you can do all the testing you want, but eventually it, it, it comes out, right? So that's one of the problems. The second problem is as well, 
Um, the people who designed the robot originally is one team, and they're a fairly small and unified team where the mechatronics people and the uh, software people, they're just very well ingrained with each other. And it's kind of, they know holistically the system. And as this goes bigger and bigger and, you know, the teams get bigger and stuff, you start getting these verticals. So, you know, you'll have the instrument people and you'll have the joint people and you'll have the screen people and you'll have the embedded software people. And they don't talk as much and then people leave. So inherent knowledge leaves the team the ones who did the original design and knew how to get around some of them problems. New people join and, you know, and a, and a Python programmer who's done kettles or toasters, you know, may not know the intricacies of some of the Python coding that's happening in that robot. So these things can happen later. And, and I think that is what, again, with these complex systems, that's one of the, the watch outs you've got to have is that you can get lulled into a very easy false sense of security that, hey, we've cracked it, we've done it, we, it works, we've done our cadaver labs, we've done our first 100 patients. You do a couple of software upgrades, bugs go on bugs, some mechanical things change slightly, and the next thing you know, you've got these you know fairly major uh, problems that come up that require regulatory uh, notification and need resolving, you know, take resources to resolve. So it, it, it's... You know, I've lived it and breathed it, so uh, it's tough. It's really, really tough for all companies. I don't care how big you are as a company. You know, Met, you're a Medtronic, you're a J and J, you're a Striker. I don't care who you are. All of these robots are complex beasts. Mm. And you know, you you touched upon, and I love the idea. I'm gonna I'm gonna call it um, the Manchurian Candidate bug in a robot, right? Because it gets hidden in there, not intentionally, but by a series of sort of aggregated compounding liabilities it springs up later um so you know you've got that we can use that in med tech the manchurian candidate robotic bug you mentioned <laughs> talent so over the last week or two um there's been some major talent shifts at a pretty high level um in a number of organizations uh and and, and in fact um cmr I'll, I'll touch on that one i i saw it cmr kin out of asia uh, i think recently departed um, and and my network tells me that might not be the end of C-suite shifts going on at CMR and they just brought in a new CFO I think as well yeah um, yeah I saw I saw that announcement myself yeah. yesterday they brought in a new CFO yeah yeah a CFO who has got you know interesting background so you always look for signaling on that that's what I tend to do and you know I'm looking at signaling in that CFO finance m a what does that mean does that mean maybe something is being moved across the bow. Why do you bring in that M&A expertise on top of the CFO? So very, very interesting. Um, and then you and I were talking about J&J. &J. There were some shifts there. Yeah, uh, there was um, a really good guy, Amit, who um, was in charge of R&D. I saw that he left and uh, and left the company. Um, and the reason that, that caught my eye is that he's one of the people that I talked to in the past uh, about different robots and I just found him you know really quite a knowledgeable and good guy so again change is happening there I don't know if that does doesn't impact Otava but again you just when you start seeing people moving around out of things like you know R&D heads um it just makes you scratch your head a little bit yeah and J&J &J, you know Martin Bueller's over there who's a lovely and incredibly intelligent man you know that's shifted around a bit too uh and again it, it goes back to that three VP problem is some VP has a vision they try it, doesn't work. They bring in a second VP, they try and fix it. And then finally, they just keep on shifting out the VP to try and fix the problem that, again, is inherently planted architecturally into the system. So this comes back to the complexity. Yeah, I think, I think you know, if I, if I was going to give a piece of advice to people, it would be don't make rash changes to the team. If, you, if, you've got, if you've got some really good people who've got that institutional knowledge that goes right back to the founding of the of the device. Those people are the people that will, you know, there's an old story, and I don't know if I've ever told you this story about this, there's, there's a ship that's broken, it's sitting in a harbor, I'll, I'll call it Liverpool, because that's where I come from, and the engine won't start, and they can't get it to start, and they try everything and bring all these consulting firms in to look at the engine, it doesn't work. And in the end, this little wizened old guy, about 85 years old, comes in, and they said, you're gonna help? And he said, yeah, yeah I've been called in to help. And, um, he gets out this little bag, he looks at the engine, he looks around, takes out this tiny little hammer, goes up to one small nut on the edge of the engine, and he taps it. 
and the engine starts. And the guy said, well, that's, that's amazing. How much do we owe you? He said, uh, 100,000. They said, 100,000. I mean, you, you came in, it was 10 minutes, not even 10 minutes, and you just got hammer and tapped it. He said, you're not paying me for the tapping. You're, t you're paying me for the knowledge of where to tap. Yeah. And that's with the robots is the people you need to keep, the people who know where to tap the robot. <laughs> love that story and it's and it's so true that tribal knowledge is what i warn all the time organizations as they transition out you can still top grade talent and not but and you need to figure out how to keep that tribal knowledge in house yeah. uh, because you don't miss it until it's too late uh, and, and and that's a tough one um so sages uh staying on staying on a large format so virtual incision made its coming out party there they had quite a presence uh, had good, uh, really good activity uh, around uh, uh, their booth. Uh, still a lot of questions around virtual. Uh, I love the new category. Um, I love the effort. I love the engineering in it. Still a lot of questions as people were looking at it saying, fantastic, but where does it fit? Where does that form factor fit versus some of the others coming out? Any insights on that? Yeah, so I, th I think what we're going to start seeing is, oh, oh what I hope we start to see is that people find a real sweet spot for their device, okay, where it has sense. And I'm going to talk on this, actually, uh, probably um, something like SRS, I'm going to try and talk about this a little bit, is there's a lot of robots that can do a lot of things, but where's the most sensible place for them to do their thing? Where they do it well, and it's the right place for them to do it, and it's the right procedure to do it. And I think with virtual incision, you know, they, they did a lot of the work on the colorectal. And that kind of, at first I was thinking, wow, why would you go for the colorectal? But then I realized that if you're going to do the anastomosis, they don't have a stapler and things like this. And you, you've got to exteriorize the bowel. So you've got to make an incision anyway. So they could actually put the, uh, the, the, the access port, which is quite big, through where the incision was going to be, where they exteriorized the bowel. So it made sense to me. I said, okay, now I get why you did it there because it makes sense that your incision incorporates your placement of your device. So it made it just made some sense to me. So I think they've all got to work out where can people go, uh -huh, okay, yeah, that makes sense to me. Yeah, I get that. I can, I can buy that. I, I understand that. So I think that's going to be an important part for all these companies, including virtual incision. Is there a sweet spot there because you don't end up with a midline large incision and another incision? Maybe maybe these are the sort of things that will come out in the next couple of years. Right, but you've in order to do that and be isolated in a single procedure, you've got to bring costs way down on that. Yeah. Right. So if you, if again, you know, I, I have this is is if you can cover a lot of uh, 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 procedures, you might be able to have a like an intuitive a, a larger a larger point of entry on economics. But if you're going to have a limited number of procedures, whether it's acuity or whether it's an actual specific procedure itself you've got to figure out the economics on it because that will bury you very quickly. Yeah, I think the economics is one part of the equation. I think the other part of the equation is the education. If you're only going to be in one procedure, you can't have massive education required to just be able to do one procedure. You can't go off site for three days, then come back and just be able to do one procedure. So in all of these things, you've got to get the cost down, but you've also got to get all the other barriers to it down, such as the education side of things. Can you can you make it so that it's almost in OR training? And that was one of the things that struck me about Moon, by the way, when, when, I, when I talked to Anne in the past, when she said, you know, we don't take people off site to train them. We don't take them away. But what we basically do is we we train them in the operating room and they just do like a hands-on buttonology for two hours before the system. I think that's where the companies have got to get smart because the justification, if, if I'm going to do all my procedures with an XI or whatever, I can go for two days to a lab. I can justify the time off and my lost time and my, my institutional losses. If I can only do one procedure, that equation starts changing dramatically of what, you know, the, the pain versus the gain becomes. So I think there's a lot of things and cost is one of them. Education is another one of them. And the whole servicing side of it is another. So, so I, I want to, I want to unpack that for a second because this is what happened in structural heart when, when everybody went down the path of mitral repair, replace or tricuspid repair, replace the training, the, the, the skills required at least 
just currently or even recent past, in order to, to execute as an interventionalist on those devices, you had to almost pick a school to go to, meaning this is the device I'm gonna use, this is the procedure I'm gonna use, and they aren't as transferable of skills. And then you locked yourself into that catheter valve solution, whether it was repair, replace. But it, I'm, 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 I'm seeing that challenge on market adoption and ability for robots. If I only pick one procedure and learn one way, I am now moving all the other opportunities, future opportunities out of the way um, to be locked in that procedure. And I don't know if the economics are gonna support that um, in a you know, 600 to $800 per case versus 35,000 per case in a mitral valve repair replacement. Yeah, and I, and I think this is where this whole fine balance is gonna come in. It is, it all, it is gonna work, especially in the US, it's gonna all work on the profit and the, the economics of it. And I think you're right, you know, some of these, some of these big um, neurovascular or, or structural heart or these different things, when you've got a 23,000, $33,000 procedure and there's a lot of margin in there, a lot of headroom in there, you can be a little bit more fine pointed sectorial. I think if you're, you know, a general surgeon or a gynecological surgeon and you're doing a, you know, a procedure that's, you know, got 6,000 reimbursement, you, you've got a whole different way that you've got to look at that. And I think, you know, go back to why is it so difficult to get these big formats on? It's, it's not just about the robot. It's about what's your unique value proposition. What's your pricing model? What's your commercial model? What's your education model? What's your, you know, um, the way that you, you, you help the institutions to understand that the vol the value of your form factor brings and why these are huge complexities and if you, you know if you get it wrong you you, you could easily the, the whole system your system works but no one can understand well why should i buy it so you said buy it you said something a couple of weeks ago that i do, i'm hoping that the large strategic and even the mid caps who think that they're in robotics because they've got something in clinical trials. Um, you know, you've got that, that mentality of, oh, well, I put enough money into it already, I can't bail on it. Um, that might be a mistake with a couple of the players right now, in my opinion, um, throwing more money to maybe less optimal money. But you said something a couple of weeks ago that really hit me more than anything else that I've thought about in surgical robotics over the last seven to 10 years. There's a vintage right now of robotics that are available. They might not be 100% faked. And you can go across the category. You can go across EndoQuest and Moon and Distal Motion and, and, and some of the others that, that are CMR that are in the U.S., right, or in trials right now in the U.S. If you miss this vintage, you're going to wait another five-plus years minimum, and you could probably give me a better guesstimate on that, before you have another go-around for a large format soft tissue robot yeah um this is not like developing you know another stapler which could be a fair i wouldn't say a fast cycle but a fast enough cycle the development time for these to get them developed working proven tested paperwork regulatory you know, it's five to ten years and if you miss it now even if, as you say, if some of them are not quite perfect, I I would be with them right now because otherwise I've got a, a decade of a gap potentially if, when I'm at the game. And how is the market going to transition in that decade? You know, there's some good indicators of where it's going to go, but if there's a colossal shift and you're not in it, you can't pick up the phone and say to the R&D team, okay, get me a robot next week. It just doesn't happen that way. And there won't also be, because there's, there's a whole problem with investment into robotics at the minute. There's not a huge amount of new investment going into the new robots. So there's there's a there's a generational gap coming um, where what there is today and what there's around today, people need to look at that and decide, you know, I either want to buy it or, or, or incorporate it or do something with it today. Because if not, there is going to be a desert in your company for five to 10 years. And I think if the market shifts in the way I'm predicting it's going to shift, that's going to be really, really painful. If so if you're a tower company, for example, and there's a whole shift towards, you know, DV5, not directly going after towers, but the tower in there just 
as collateral damage, you sell 30% less towers. Mm -hmm. And you've not got a robot that can justify why they should buy your tower tied to the robot. I, I, I don't know what you do for those 10 years. It's, it's, it sets up for that partnering that you and I have been talking about is you might not have to go in and acquire a, uh, a census like maybe Stortz is trying to do for argument's sake, or as Distal sits out there and Moon sits out there as two particulars. Where, where does J&J &J and Medtronic slide into that as a partnering model so at least it keeps them in the game and the investors on Distal and the investors on Moon get to realize maybe it's not a lump sum acquisition maybe it's a longer term tail on guaranteed licensing on revenue and you don't have to put together a sales team etc so i'm 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 expecting the brains are bigger than mine um in corporate that realizes after this vintage is over you've got a 10-year time frame because you're not going to be able to bring in a chinese robot no and 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 even you know some of the other systems out of Europe, and, and, I, and, I, and I'm pretty familiar with most of them, you're not going to be able to capture that market as easily on the large format to soft tissue. Endovascular, different game. But in this largest market right now in soft tissue, you've got three on the table right now, most likely, maybe four, depending on you want to count them. And after that, it's done. Yeah. And, and, I, and I, again, my, my advice to anybody in the industry thinking about this at the minute is don't put your eggs all in one basket if you can. You know, and the way that you get to that is to not buy the whole thing, but maybe do, you know, a deal where you work together. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm a marketing background. Segmentation for me and, you know, every industry has segmentation of their market. They have the bronze and they have the silver and the gold and they, they give you different things in those things. I, I think we don't do enough segmentation that way to appease all of the segments. And the reason I say that is not, not so much that they go after it from a marketing point of view, but it's a, it's an insurance bet. If one of your segments just tanks, right? You, 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 have, you have one of your robots that is just, you can't get the thing to work. It has too many failures. You can't get the pricing point right. There's a reason why that segment tanks. You're not dead. You've got two other segments that you can say, okay, let's flip a little bit. It's not ideal, but it's a plan B and we get, we get these other two segments and we ride those segments up. So I, I would hope that a lot of the companies are looking at segmentation a little bit more seriously than just saying, well, we have one killer robot that's going to, you know, take on intuitive and win the world. I, th I think that's, that's the wrong way to look at this. You're right. Every other market does that. They have redundancies in place. They have balance across their portfolios. Um, you know, the segmentation, if you will, in soft tissue was from straight stick, right, to wristed. Now the jump to robotics. So they've got that lower end covered, but now you start coming back around and you can make that argument with Distal and Moon that it still empowers that market because that business does not go away, but actually you've got a delivery mechanism with both of them that feeds the Medtronic and the J&J &J sort of analog straight stick and wristed instrument world. So that, that's an interesting point there too. Um, and then finally, I know you've got the, the tenure in this, um, it came out yesterday that Med Robotics uh, uh, finally went into a full sold off asset. And th if, if you haven't been around robotics for long enough, you didn't know that Medro at one point in time was a, 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 a reasonably you know, solid play until they ran into some issues, a uh, couple issues, but you know, in particular, uh, willful infringement as, as, as you, you and I talked about on some patents by, uh, it was uh, Endobotics. Um, and that was, that was the precursor to EndoQuests and some of these other um, sort of flexible robots. Thoughts in that market? Yeah, so, so I think that there's, there's definitely gonna be a space for um, flexible endoscopic robots. And I, and I actually think that Intuitive is gonna look at some of their technology to go that way eventually. It's not a huge segment, but but I think where where that, that segment is is in the rendezvous rendezvous procedures. I think that that's going to be one of the things we're going to get to, which is where you're going to have dual systems working one from inside the bowel, one from outside the bowel, and therefore you can do you know uh, rendezvous and do much more um, tissue sparing 
procedures. You're going to be able to take out, you know, like a sessile polyp in a really good way from both sides, close it, make sure it's all airtight, do a really good job and not have to take out a whole big section of bowel, which would have been the way in the past. So I think they've got some utility in that. I think they have got some utility as well in, um, in there's, there's a couple of, um, there's a couple of pathologies out there that I think are massively un, un, underestimated in terms of the impact on them. One of them is diverticulosis. Um, there's diverticulosis and there's diverticulitis. So the diverticulitis is when you get the inflammation of the diverticulum. Diverticulosis is the presence of them. And with systems like EndoQuest, you know, you can go and now close them. So like mini hernias, they're basically like mini hernias uh, in, in the bowel. A third of all hemicolectomies are for diverticulitis. And if you could go in there with something like an EndoQuest and now close off those hernias from the inside and eliminate one third of all hemicolectomies, that's big for healthcare. That's huge for healthcare. So I think there's different things they're going to look at with these systems um, as, they, as they come to market. And I think that Intuitive will have an, uh, a flexible end endoscopic robot. I think that you know uh, Medtronic will eventually have one. Everyone's got to have one to be able to stay in the race. I think the the second part of what you were saying earlier is um, what's what's the issue with IP? Okay. And I think that this is something, I'm going to go full circle again to what we said earlier, why is it so hard to bring a robot to the market? You just have to go and look at the patent landscape. The patent landscape is amazing. And yes, Intuitive had a lot of patents, but the, you know, people are filing patents like you wouldn't believe. The Chinese are filing patents at a rate that is absolutely frightening in robotics. So half of the equation is going to be, you know, what IP estate do I have? But like in the med robotics, whose IP do I crash into in order to put my product on the market? So this is this, uh, a lot of people don't understand it too much, but it's, it's freedom to operate. Have I got the freedom to operate? Can, can I implement my patents and reduce to practice my product without stepping on somebody else's toes, either method patents or, or other patents? And I think in the robotics space, one of the hardest things that's going to be, whether it be flexible robotics like EndoQuest or any of these, or the large main formats, the IP landscape and the freedom to operate is a really difficult thing to navigate around. And why it's important is most patents that are uh, you know, there's, there's virtually not a product in the world where it, you know, only that has the pattern and they can't build something around it. But what it usually means is to be able to get around the freedom to operate, I have to make sacrifices in my design. And therefore, what happens is you have a less reliable robot or you have a robot that is way more complex in its workflow, not because that's how you wanted to build it, mm -hmm. but if I want to get around these patterns of a one-piece pattern, I've got to make it a three-piece device. So I think all of these things are going to come out as well uh, as we go forwards. And again, IP lawsuits only sort of happen usually when people tread into the US. That's when that's kind of when the trigger happens. And as of yet, no one's really gone in and triggered the US. A census was in there, um, but they didn't really do a lot, a lot of damage. Once you now get in there and you're going to have Medtronic, J and J some of the others going in there, if they do do any damage to intuitive, I, I could foresee here, there's either going to be a mutually assured destruction where everyone thinks each of their patents allows them to have a kind of Mexican standoff, or we are going to suddenly see litigation start going at a fairly high churn. I don't know which way it's going to go. Yeah, I think it's going to be litigation. You're watching that with Noah right now. You know, there was some questionable uh, 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 behavior around how they got their... Um, sort of technology uh, that was shuttled out of uh, the war goes. Um, it was shuttled out on a thumb drive uh, when uh, Oris shut down. And then from what I understand, Intuitive's coming after them right now. Uh, so with, with Noah having J&J &J and Intuitive breathing down their neck, I think it's because when you start to become a clear and present threat, that's when you have these corporate lawyers with billions of dollars at risk and hundreds of millions to spend against a small player, um, you're gonna start crushing people. So that'll be interesting. And again, it goes back to the vintage, Steve, is the IP, the, p the patent landscape, 
um, right now is starting have high elbows being thrown everywhere, and it's just going to get more and more crowded um, in the paint. So I don't I don't see that changing at all. In fact, in, in incorporating more risk, um, you're going to be at SRS. So you know, shouting out here, uh, Vip Patel's SRS down in Orlando. I think you're you're an investor day uh, sort of dropping some knowledge on everybody. What's happening there? Yeah, I've, I've been very kindly asked to come and uh, do a presentation at the Investor Day, so I'm thrilled to do that. And thanks to Vip and uh, to Amit there who invited me to do that. So look, very look, much looking forward to being down in Florida and uh, being at SRS, which I think will be a great meeting. Yeah, we'll be there. Dragonfly Studios will be on the floor. Uh, Vip has set it up with uh, us having some really interesting and, uh, again, hopefully provocative and informative sessions on the floor. And uh, I think you agreed already to co-host some of those with me, didn't you? Yes, I think so, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, my friend, listen, I always appreciate our uh, trading of information here. I think the industry does as well. It's, uh, it's a privilege to be able to do it with you. Thank you very much. Now, it's always good fun and enjoyable to do it, so great. All right, Steve, you take care of yourself, my friend. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I'm Joe Mullings with Steve Bell from 160 Studios. Be well.